Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon for our spacey live stream. Today's live stream will be a little bit different than we've done so far. We're going to take a little tour through our solar system. Um, so I wanted to welcome you all again and thank you all for joining us uh, once again. And I do want to give a special shout out uh, to our 10,000 loyal Union Station members for their ongoing support during during this really difficult time. Uh, it was announced earlier today via email, if you missed it, um, that as a way of acknowledging your loyalty and sustaining uh, sustaining support of Union Station and Science City, uh, Union Station is adding three full months of benefits to your current membership. We can't wait to see you here at the station again when everything reopens. Uh, so once again, uh, we do thank all of our loyal members uh, and uh, we definitely thank all our visitors for tuning in as well and hope you consider membership in the future. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station, uh, and I am your virtual Planetarium Specialist today as we are uh, tuning in from Kansas City as well as other places around the world. We've had a lot of uh, people tuning in from different countries around the, around the world, so we're really uh, excited that you're choosing uh, our online content uh, for these, uh, these times when we're all staying at home and in, enjoying our home time. Like I said, today we are going to do a little solar system tour. Um, I've had a ton of fun answering all of your questions uh, as they've been coming in for our star tours. There's a lot of content that I want to cover today, though, um, so it might be a little difficult for me uh, to get to some of those questions today. I do want to remind you, though, that on Friday for our live stream, it'll be all about questions and answers. So we'll have plenty of time to dive into all those questions. If I miss a question today, we'll make sure to write that down and bring it back up on Friday to answer it. So be sure to tune in then. But once again, Friday is going to be our question and answer fan Friday for all of you uh, who have uh, been joining us uh, for these awesome live streams. And today we're going to focus on the solar system tour, uh, which might take 30 to 40 minutes. So we may not have time to get all those questions. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. So uh, today we are going to be using a little piece of software I teased last Friday, I think. It's called Space Engine. Um, this is not a free piece of software. You do have to pay for this, but it is pretty fancy. It has a simulation of our entire known universe, uh, as well as simulations for unknowns. Uh, so uh, but we're going to focus on the knowns today, look, taking a look at our solar system and we're going to jump right in now our solar system is named our solar system because it is a planetary system of planets revolving around a special star uh, we call our sun uh, scientists sometimes will call it sol though uh, so we can zoom in this is our entire solar system these lines representing representing the orbital paths of uh, the planets and many dwarf planets in our solar system but well, we're going to start out with of the sun, sort of the uh, parent of our solar system, all the planets orbiting around it. And woo, we zoom in far enough, we'll be able to see its atmosphere in greater detail. Uh, now, our sun is about four and a half billion years old. It's a yellow dwarf star. It is sort of an average sized star and a star of an average age. It has an average amount of mass, um, but of course, we love it all the same, even though it's average. Um, our sun is one of the 500 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 26,000 light years away from the center of our galaxy, which is about two thirds of the way from the center. Um, so things are kind of sparse out here. There aren't a lot of stars nearby. In fact, the closest star is about four light years away, um, which doesn't sound like uh, pretty far, but that is very far. Um, our sun uh, moves as it uh, move, well, our sun moves throughout our galaxy. It actually orbits the galactic center once every 250 million years. Um, which is a very long time. All the stars are constantly moving, um, and uh, we call this proper motion. So whenever you look up at the stars in the night sky, um, the picture of the constellations we see today is not how they're going to stay forever. The stars are very slowly moving, um, and uh, it's kind of crazy to think that our night sky is actually pretty dynamic. It's just the way we perceive it, and our lifespans are short enough that we don't really get to see those constellations changing shape that much. Uh, so, like I said, our sun is an average sized star, although it does contain over 99.8% of the mass in, of our entire solar system, so it is pretty big uh, relative to everything else around it. Um, the sun is spinning, um, and we can kind of fast forward time here uh, to see it spinning. The sun spins uh, at its equator once about every 25 days or so, um, but it is a ball of gas, so it does kind of spin at uneven rates. You can see the sun's corona, its upper atmosphere, kind of floating around here in this simulation. Um, so uh, the surface temperature of our sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty hot. 
Um, but at its core, temperatures reach over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. At its core, our sun is uh, fusing hydrogen into helium. The sun is kind of like an onion. There are different layers. At the very center is a core of helium. Then there's a layer of uh, hydrogen that's becoming fused into helium. And then on the outer, or the outer layers of the sun is just pure hydrogen. Um, our sun is about middle-aged. It's about halfway through its life cycle. So in about 4 billion years, it will reach the end of its life cycle. Basically, once it finishes fusing all of its hydrogen into helium, it will, won't have any extra fuel to burn, and it'll kind of expand and dissipate its layers back out into space. Um, our sun has eight planets in its orbit. That's right, I said eight. We can fight about Pluto a little bit later. Um, it has at least five dwarf planets, uh, confirmed, tens of thousands of asteroids, and up to three trillion comets and icy bodies floating around. So there are a lot of objects that are bound by the gravity of our sun. And without further ado, let's jump into the first notable object, the first planet from the sun, Mercury. Oh, so we're going to go ahead and oops, fly to Mercury. Mercury is the smallest planet in our solar system, just a bit larger than our moon, actually. Um, it is, interestingly, the second densest planet in our solar system after Earth, though, so a lot of material packed in there. Now, one kind of fun fact about Mercury is, though it is the closest planet to the sun, it is not the hottest planet in our solar system. Temperatures do reach over 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, but because there's no atmosphere, Mercury is so close to the sun that any atmosphere it had, tried to hold on to got burnt away. Um, but because it has no atmosphere, it gets down to below minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit at night. So pretty extreme temperature ranges. Uh, Mercury's rotational axis is uh, not really tilted, unlike the Earth's and many other planets. Um, this actually uh, creates a region near its poles uh, that uh, has some deep craters that actually are plunged into eternal shadow. So there's some craters here. So actually, if we uh, want to rotate with Mercury, and if I fast forward time enough here, we'll be able to see... There we go. So we're we're going to fast forward quite a bit here, maybe a little less. <laughs> um, there are some craters on the poles of Mercury that are always in shadow, like I said. A probe we sent to Mercury uh, called the Messenger Probe in the late 2000s actually discovered frozen water in some of these deep craters. So even though Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, there's actually water on it. And we'll find that many planets in our solar system do have water. Let's go ahead and return ourselves to normal time. And we're going to go ahead and jump forwards uh, since we're already eight minutes into this uh, thing and only one planet in. We definitely want to move on so we can check out other planets. Let's go to Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun. We took a quick look at Venus uh, last Friday uh, during our star tour since Venus is the brightest point of light in our night sky tonight in the early evening. Uh, appearing to set in the west. It's that really bright point of light that's not twinkling that you can see in the western sky tonight, if you're here in the Midwest. Um, Venus is often called Earth's sister planet. It's about the same size as Earth, and it is a solid, solid rocky surface like Earth. It has an atmosphere like Earth, and it has clouds and weather patterns, and it, it even has rain. Um, but that's about where the similarities stop, because Venus's clouds are much thicker than Earth's. Unlike Earth's clouds, which are composed mostly of nitrogen, um, Venus's clouds are made up of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. It's a gas that's really good at trapping heat. So over millions of years, all that carbon dioxide in Venus's atmosphere has trapped uh, the heat, turning Venus into a giant oven and making it the hottest planet in our solar system, even hotter than Mercury. Uh, we can actually remove the clouds of Venus, and we can see its surface in greater detail. Uh, average temperatures are over 900 degrees Fahrenheit on Venus in daytime and nighttime. Uh, there are clouds of sulfuric acid filling its uh, atmosphere, and that sulfuric acid does rain as well. There are hurricane force winds of over 200 miles per hour, uh, and it's covered in over a thousand major volcanoes. Uh, unlike Earth's volcanoes, though, uh, which are caused by plate tectonics, it's thought that Venus's volcanoes um, are caused by uh, the extreme heat weakening the planet's crust. I'm going to do a quick edit to stream here. Oh, there we go. All right. So that is Venus. Now, we have tried to explore Venus back in the 1970s and 80s. Both the United States and Soviet Union sent probes to Venus to photograph its surface. A few of these probes managed to touch down and send pictures back, but they only lasted minutes before they were crushed by the pressure um, and melted by the 
stream temperatures and acid. So Venus is a pretty difficult place to explore. But it is quite beautiful to look at in the skies. In fact, if you look at Venus through a pair of binoculars or a telescope, you'll actually see it appear in phases because, because Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth, then we can actually see it go through phases similar to our moon. I believe right now Venus appears as a crescent phase. All right, well, that is the second planet from our sun. How about the third planet from our sun? It's a planet that is uh, pretty popular amongst us Earthlings. Well, that's because it's Earth. Let's go ahead and fly over to our home planet, Earth. Earth is pretty great. It's the only planet that we know of that has life on it. Its axis is tilted by 23 degrees, which causes its seasons. As the Earth orbits the sun, uh, the poles will be face, uh, sort of leaning towards or away from the sun, which causes the seasons. Uh, when sort of the North Pole is facing sort of away from the sun, then the Northern Hemisphere receives less sunlight and it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Our atmosphere, like I said before, is mostly nitrogen, about 78%. 21% uh, of, of that is oxygen, which is kind of interesting. You, a lot of people think that it's mostly oxygen, but it's actually mostly nitrogen. And there is about 1% of other gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor. Our liquid metal core uh, generates a pretty strong magnetic field. This protects us from solar radiation. Uh, some of that uh, uh, energized radiation is funneled by our magnetic field, though, towards the poles, and it actually causes the aurora borealis. And we can see the aurora borealis from space here. It'll appear very, very faint. Hopefully you can see that in our stream. You can see it shining through the clouds right there. Cool. Uh, one unique thing about Earth is that uh, it's one of the few places that we know of in the universe that contains water that exists in all three phases, uh, solid, ice, liquid, and gaseous water vapor. And a lot of scientists think that this is pretty vital uh, in supporting life. So something to think about. And uh, whenever scientists look for other planets that may support life, that's one thing we look for, whether water can exist in these three forms. There may be other forms of life, unlike the life on Earth, though, that uh, doesn't need those things. but. We're starting out by looking for life that's similar to our own. Now, uh, the Earth only has one natural satellite, our moon. Let us take a look at the moon. You'll be able to find it orbiting the Earth close by. There it is. The moon is uh, the fifth largest moon in our solar system, and it is by far the largest relative to its parent planet. Uh, it's a thought that the moon was formed soon after the Earth, uh, after a object about the size of Mars crashed into the Earth and kicked up a lot of debris that um, eventually coalesced to form the moon. Uh, another piece of evidence to, towards that is, be, is uh, the fact that the moon is tidally locked. The, moon's, uh, the moon always faces the Earth in the same direction as it orbits, and this is likely caused be, uh, by... Uh, th this, this wouldn't be the case if the moon was an object that was captured by Earth. Um, but it's more likely uh, caused because of the moon uh, forming as a cloud of debris around the Earth. Just kind of an interesting detail of sort of objects in three dimensions uh, as they form like this. But it is tidally locked, like I said. Uh, one funny thing, though, is that we can actually see more than half of the moon, even though only one side faces us. It does this kind of wobble called libration. Um, and I believe I have a little clip of that. There we go. Um, so you can see uh, this sort of wobble if we sort of take pictures of the moon throughout uh, its cycle. It does this kind of cool wobble. And we can also see how it gets closer and further away from the Earth as it orbits. Um, the moon's orbit is in uh, ellipse. It's not a perfect circle, so sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's far away. In fact, last night uh, slash this morning, the full moon was a supermoon, which means that it was the closest that it gets in its orbit. It was about 14% uh, bigger and 30% brighter. Um, so hopefully you checked out uh, the moon last night. It was pretty spectacular. It's also nicknamed the pink moon, not because it appeared pink, but because it's associated with uh, springtime. Uh, one other cool thing about the moon is that uh, its apparent size in the sky is nearly the same as the sun, and this is why we have total solar eclipses, because the moon can perfectly cover up the sun, but not too much for us to still be able to see the sun's corona, its atmosphere. Um, the moon is getting further away from us every year, though, so um, solar eclipses are a relatively temporary thing. 
Uh, now, the moon is moving pretty slowly at a speed of about one and a half inches per year, um, but that is significant over a long period of time, so the moon will eventually be too far away to create a total solar eclipse. Uh, the reason the moon moves further away, by the way, is because of the Earth's tides. As the Earth rotates more quickly, the tides sort of pull the moon and feed energy back into it, um, which causes it to kind of push outward. This is a centrifugal force. All right, we are going to go ahead and move onwards. There's a lot of stuff to check out in our solar system, and we'll definitely have time on future uh, uh, future live streams to dive in more depth for some of these uh, some of these bodies. We may do a live stream where we focus only on the inner planets and only on the outer planets or something like that. If you'd like that, uh, chime in in the comments. Uh, but we are going to go ahead and move on to the fourth planet from the sun, Mars, the red planet. Here it is. Mars is nicknamed the red planet uh, because, well, it's red. This red coloring comes from the presence of iron oxide on its surface. We have iron oxide here on Earth, we call it rust, but Mars is basically a big ball of rust. Mars is roughly half the diameter of Earth, although it's only about 15% the volume of Earth, so it has uh, a far less gravity. Uh, it has a very thin atmosphere made up of mostly carbon dioxide. Now, uh, surface details on the surface of Mars suggest that it had a highly active geologic history with many volcanoes, deserts, and rift valleys, as well as a lot of impact craters still there. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be vo volcanically active now, although we did send a probe there a few years back called InSight that landed and has seismic instruments to study the core of Mars, so hopefully we'll figure out how seismically active it is. But Mars does have a number of interesting features. This one right here is pretty cool. This is Olympus Mons. This is the tallest mountain in our solar system. Olympus Mons rises above the Martian surface over 17 miles. That's tall enough that it actually pokes out above most of Mars's very thin atmosphere. So the next time you're on Mars and are looking for some mountain climbing to do, I would definitely recommend checking out Olympus Mons. I hear the views at the top will take your breath away. <laughs> uh, again, I assume there's thunderous applause and laughter uh, on the other side of my stream. I just can't hear it. You know, normally uh, that's there. Um, Let's check out another cool feature on Mars, if I can find it. There we go. So there are a couple. Uh, so Olympus Mons is an extinct volcano, by the way. And there are a couple of other uh, volcanoes next to it. And then hiding in the clouds here is something I hope I can show you. If we rewind time. Oop. No. Far. Go. Ah, here we go. So you can start to see some cracks across the surface of Mars, and then being revealed right now is an incredible canyon called the Vallis Marineris Gorge, the Mariner Valley. This canyon is over 2,500 miles long. That's long enough that it would stretch across the entire United States. The Grand Canyon, for perspective, is about 80 to 100 miles long on Earth. This canyon is also about 5 miles deep. Let's see if we can fly into it. That would look cool. Hmm. Now, uh, we did get a question uh, from Jason asking if Mars has life yet, or if we know Mars has life. Now, uh, the a probe named Curiosity, which we sent to Mars back in the summer of 2012, has been exploring Mars, and one of its primary missions has been to look for water on Mars. Um, and life on Mars. Now, Curiosity did find trace amounts of liquid water in the surface soil, which is one of the reasons why scientists think that Mars was likely covered in oceans of liquid water in the distant past. Um, but uh, we have not found any signs that it ever had life on it, or still does today. The jury's still out as to whether or not it ever did, but most scientists agree that conditions were fav favorable for life a long time in the distant past. So who knows? And hopefully we'll discover something soon about that. All right, so we are going to move right along uh, to uh, not a planet, but a very important structure in our solar system called the asteroid belt. If I zoom out here enough, and I'm going to turn these asteroids on so we can see them. Our solar system, like I said, is filled with a lot of stuff. Um, more than just our planets and the moons. It's filled with many, many, many objects uh, and many, many asteroids. Um, there are 
hundreds of thousands of asteroids that we are tracking so far, and they range in size from uh, dwarf planet size all the way down to little specks of dust. But these asteroids orbit between Mars and Jupiter. Now the reason, uh, one of the reasons why we think um, these asteroid, or this asteroid belt exists and why there is not a planet there is because Jupiter is so massive that during the formation of our solar system, the gravity from it prevented any debris in this region from coalescing to form a planet, unlike the planets closer to the sun. Now, you've probably seen pictures of the asteroid belt in science fiction, and the asteroids are really close together and constantly smashing into one another. Well, this is fiction, and most asteroids are about 500,000 miles away from one another, so um, you could actually fly straight through the asteroid belt um, in a spaceship and probably wouldn't even notice anything. Uh, so they're, it's, they're pretty spread out. Here's a notable asteroid, though. Uh, so really it's a dwarf planet. It's called Ceres. Ceres it is uh, a body that contains about one-third of the mass of the entire asteroid belt, which is kind of crazy. Um, a spacecraft named Dawn back in 2014 actually detected water vapor on Ceres. Um, so we think that it may Ceres may have had an internal liquid ocean in its distant past. There's some really bright points on Ceres uh, and you might think that, oh, these could be cities of aliens or something, but they're actually just highly reflective, um, uh, sort of crystallized particles. Let's go ahead and move right along to the biggest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. Jupiter is by far the biggest planet in our solar system. It's bigger than all seven other planets combined, or combined uh, by two and a half times. You could fit a thousand Earths inside of Jupiter. Jupiter is uh, composed of mostly hydrogen and helium. This is the same stuff that our sun is made out of. In fact, uh, when our sun was forming, two other bodies were trying to become stars as well, Jupiter and Saturn. They just never quite got big enough to turn into stars. Now, as you can see, Jupiter is very stormy. Its clouds uh, have a lot of features and a lot of hurricane-like storms on it. One of these storms is very notable, the Great Red Spot. This hurricane has been raging in the clouds of Jupiter for at least 300 years. Now, the Great Red Spot, when it was first photographed uh, back in the 70s by the Voyager space probes, uh, was about three times as wide as the Earth, but we have observed it to be shrinking over the past few decades. And let me pull up a picture of that for you here. So as you can see here, um, the Great Red Spot is quite a bit smaller than it has been in the past. And uh, scientists actually think it might disappear within our lifetimes, which is pretty crazy. It's only about the width of the Earth now, about one third the size it was about 40, 50 years ago. Now Jupiter, as you might've noticed, has quite a few moons. Uh, Jupiter has 79 known moons, which sounds like a lot, but it is actually not the most known moons in our solar system. And uh, exciting news about that in just a moment to share. But um, focusing on Jupiter's moons, uh, these are pretty cool. Uh, now, these moons come in two different varieties. Many of the moons of Jupiter, or some of them, orbit uh, sort of flat in line with Jupiter's uh, orbital rotation here. You can see they kind of form a frisbee or disk. These moons were formed in the early days of our solar system, and their orbits were flattened, up, flattened out by gravity and centripetal force. But the moons that are farther out, as you can see, orbit at a variety of angles, and some of them even orbit backwards relative to Jupiter's rotation. These outer moons were more, li more likely captured asteroids or comets, objects that were flying by Jupiter and were snatched up by its massive gravitational field. Now, because Jupiter is so massive and it, because it captures so many, many of these types of objects, uh, humanity in a way owes our thanks to Jupiter. It's so massive that it has likely captured many large objects that were passing through our solar system and could have potentially been dangerous to the development and continuation of life on Earth. So thanks for that, Jupiter. Thanks for being the solar system's Roomba. I want to visit one of the moons of Jupiter, a pretty cool one uh, that is one of my favorites. It's Io. Io is one of Jupiter's Galilean moons. There are four very large moons of Jupiter that you can actually see through a pair of binoculars or a telescope. 
Galileo saw them when he looked through his telescope at Jupiter, and it was observing these four moons and charting their locations that actually uh, was, was one of the first pieces of evidence that led to his, his theory that it was the sun at the center of our universe and not the Earth, center of our solar system at least. Uh, these moons were Io, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa. Io is a volcanic moon. It's covered in thousands of volcanoes because it's so close to Jupiter, it's constantly pulled by uh, the gravitational and tidal forces of Jupiter, which constantly deforms its crust and keeps it from properly cooling. You can actually see some of these volcanoes glowing here. Pretty cool. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next planet, my personal favorite planet, Saturn. While we're flying there, uh, let's see what our comments are saying. Oh, I just wanted to, oh, uh, just wanted to thank uh, a couple of you for the awesome feedback, guys. Jason, I appreciate your watching with your family. I'm glad you guys are enjoying these. Uh, and Melissa, these are kind of a spaceitarium, aren't they? Um, <laughs> Glad you guys are enjoying these, and I'm excited to keep doing them. Um, oh, we did have a question uh, from Lissa about uh, Jupiter, asking if it's possible that fusion is going on inside of Jupiter. Well, as Jupiter and Saturn were forming uh, and growing in size, they never quite got big enough to start fusion. If they had grown in size to a large enough uh, mass, gravity would have started fusion at their core, but they didn't get to that point. So if they started fusion, they would turn into stars. Uh, and Nicole, uh, Jupiter and Saturn won't become stars in the future. They would have to uh, gain uh, quite a bit of mass, probably becoming over 50 times as large. So uh, it's pretty unlikely that they'll turn into stars in the future. Let's talk about Saturn. Saturn is the second biggest planet in our solar system. It's another gas giant planet, although you'll notice it's not quite as stormy as Jupiter. This is mostly thanks to Saturn's relatively low density. In fact, Saturn is the least dense planet in our solar system. It's also the only planet that's less dense than water. That means that if you gave all the planets a bath in a giant bathtub, Saturn is the only one that would float. I wouldn't recommend trying that though because it might leave a ring on the tub if you gave it a giant bath. All right, uh, Saturn of course has a beautiful system of rings. Let's turn the moons off here so we can see them more clearly. Saturn's rings are composed mostly of water ice. These chunks of ice range in size from as big as your hand to as big as your house. Scientists think that these rings were formed when one of Saturn's moons got a little bit too close to the planet and got ripped apart by the force of gravity. These rings extend above its clouds over 75,000 miles, although on average they're only 60 feet thick, which is about as wide as the planetarium is. Saturn uh, holds the record for most known moons in our solar system. It contains over 82 known moons, and this number grew by quite a bit uh, about a year ago when scientists announced about 20 additional moons that were recently discovered. So it used to be Jupiter had the most known moons, but now Saturn does. And similarly, Saturn has some moons that orbit in line with it, as well as many others that orbit at a variety of angles. A couple of cool moons I definitely want to show you. Let's see if I can find the one I want to show you. There it is. Let's take a look at Enceladus. Enceladus is one of the most reflective moons in our solar system. As you can see, it's incredibly shiny, mostly because it's covered in thick layers of water ice. Now, a probe named Cassini orbited Saturn for about a decade, and it also shot by a few of the moons. And when it passed by Enceladus, it actually discovered jets uh, of water uh, and water vapor emanating from the, uh, uh, some vents near the poles of Enceladus. And uh, detect or taking a look at that water in more detail and taking a look at Enceladus in more detail, we found that uh, Enceladus likely has an ocean of liquid water below the icy surface. For that reason, Enceladus is one of the top candidates for a place in our solar system that may already have life. So maybe we'll send a mission to Enceladus someday. Titan is another famous moon of Saturn. Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system. 
It's the only moon with a dense atmosphere, and it's the only other body in our solar system besides Earth that has liquid oceans on its surface. Now, these oceans are not made of water, they're made of liquid methane. However, Titan is pretty high on our list of places we'd like to explore someday in the future because of its uh, oceanic surface. See these oceans right here. Titan is also one of the few places that we have landed a spacecraft on. The Huygens probe was launched from Cassini, and Annette managed to land on a Titan and take pictures of its wet surface. And we move swiftly along to the next planet, uh, which is Uranus. Uranus is the first of what we call the ice giants. Uranus and Neptune are gas giant planets, but they're extremely cold, and so we have nicknamed, nicknamed them ice giants. Uh, now, Uranus also has rings. Uh, its rings are far fainter uh, than Saturn's, though. If I pump up the exposure here for a program, you can see them there. But they are very, very faintly visible right there. Uranus was the first planet discovered with the aid of a telescope. All the other planets are visible with the naked eye, but Uranus and Neptune need a telescope to be seen. Like, uh, uh, like Venus, uh, actually I forgot to mention about Venus, but like Venus, uh, Uranus has a retrograde spin. So most of the planets in our solar system uh, spin in the same direction as they orbit the sun, but Venus and Uranus actually spin in the opposite direction, which is kind of interesting. Venus, I forgot to mention, uh, is really weird because of that. Um, Venus, uh, its daytime is actually longer than its year. One day on Venus is 240 Earth days long, and its year is 224 Earth days. Um, so another weird thing about Venus. Uh, and like I said, Uranus also spins in retrograde. Uh, the weird thing about Uranus, though, is its uh, spin, its rotation is uh, almost 90 degrees perpendicular to the sun's, uh, to uh, the sun. So how the, you know, the Earth is rotated 23 degrees, but Venus, or sorry, Uranus is rotated, or tilted, rather, more than 90 degrees. Um, just kind of crazy here, so we're kind of disoriented here, but if I spin, our, spin us around and we look at the other planets in our solar system, so this is the plane of our solar system here, we zoom back in on Uranus, you can see that it is tilted very, very far over, over 90 degrees. We don't know much else about uh, Uranus um, because we've only visited one, visited it once by a man-made spacecraft, the Voyager 2 probe in 1986. We're still learning a lot about these distant bodies. On to the final planet in our solar system, the final official planet at least, Neptune. Neptune is another ice giant planet. Its clouds are a bit more detailed uh, than Uranus is though. Uh, Neptune is very far away. It's uh, so far away that light takes four hours to get from the sun to it, whereas light takes about eight minutes to get to the Earth from the sun. The reason Neptune is so blue is not because there's any water in its clouds. Its clouds are mostly uh, made up of uh, high concentrations of methane, which uh, gives its atmosphere that blue color. Now, Neptune is the windiest planet in our solar system. Winds on Neptune reach over 1,500 miles per hour, and this causes very strong storms in its clouds. And there have been, on numerous occasions, great dark spots, kind of like the Great Red Spot on Jupiter, but hurricane storms that appeared in the clouds of Venus, but they only last a few years before they disappear. And Neptune, like I said, is the final planet in our solar system, the final official planet we zoom out and up here, we can see that the eight planets in our solar system all orbit very similarly to each other, so they appear to go very nicely together. But there are a few other famous bodies that uh, at certain other points in history have been considered planets. One of these bodies is Pluto. I believe that is it. So let's take a look at Pluto and talk a little bit about it. Now the question we almost get the most at the planetarium is, why is Pluto not considered a planet anymore? Well, here's the deal. Pluto was discovered in the early 1900s, but since its discovery, we have found a lot of other objects in our solar system like Pluto that behave similarly to it, 
uh, such as Ceres, the dwarf planet we saw earlier. Uh, because of this, we got to this point in the early 2000s where there were a lot of uh, candidates for planets. There were a lot of objects that were uh, just as good as Pluto, so they should be added to the planet list. But there were so many of them that uh, the International Astronomical Union got together and they decided to reclassify planets and redefine what it meant to be a planet. So they came up with three rules to follow that you have to be a planet. Um, the first rule that you have to follow is that you have to go around the sun. Okay, well, so the Earth goes around the sun. It checks that box. The moon does not go around the sun, though. It goes around the Earth, so the moon is not a planet. The Earth is. Pluto does go around the sun, although Pluto orbits the sun at a very weird inclination, a very weird angle. Compared to the official planets in our solar system, Pluto's orbit is sort of diagonal here, you can see. Pluto in red and the official planets in bright green. But Pluto does go around the sun, so it checks that first box. The second rule you have to follow to be considered a planet is you have to have, uh, or you have to be large enough that gravity has formed your mass into a round shape. Um, so there are many objects orbiting the sun, all those objects in the asteroid belt, for example, but they're not quite big enough uh, to be considered planets because uh, they are small and rocky. Um, you have to be large enough that gravity has kind of smushed all of your mass into a spherical shape. Well, um, we weren't we uh, we were not sure what Pluto actually looked like until 2015, when the New Horizons spacecraft passed by Pluto and took close-up photographs. Um, but as we can see in these uh, pictures, let's zoom back in on Pluto. Pluto is indeed round. Um, Pluto is quite nice. Uh, see, it's sort of a brownish yellow or brownish whitish color but it is definitely round so it checks the second box now the third rule you have to follow to be considered a planet is you have to have cleared your orbital path of other debris um so for example a Ceres is a round object orbiting the sun but it shares its orbit with many of many asteroids in the asteroid belt the earth is so big that it has sort of gobbled up everything in its path and it's the only thing that orbits in its path and its lane so to speak um but pluto has not cleared its orbit in fact pluto shares its orbit with of many objects, such as its own moon, Charon. Charon is so large that it exerts an inc a very strong gravitational pull on Pluto, so much so that Pluto actually orbits Charon. The Berry Center, the center of the orbital, uh, uh, the orbital uh, uh, structure here, is actually outside of Pluto. So if we were to uh, track this and fast forward time, we can see that Pluto actually orbits its own moon. So Pluto has not cleared its orbital path of debris, so Pluto is not considered a planet. It is classified as a dwarf planet. Now it is the largest dwarf planet in the solar system, and it is still out there, so we shouldn't feel too bad about Pluto. Uh, let's go ahead, take a closer look at Pluto. Here we go. Now these are actual photographs taken of Pluto. Uh, by the New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, Pluto is a very icy planet, uh, dwarf planet, excuse me. It's covered in uh, a lot of different minerals, but it also is covered in uh, surface ice. And uh, when Pluto faces the sun, some of the surface ice thaws and actually forms a very thin atmosphere. We kind of position ourselves with the sun in front of it. We can see this atmosphere. Pluto's atmosphere actually extends further out into space than Earth's atmosphere, which is kind of crazy that this distant dwarf planet actually has an atmosphere. Its atmosphere is composed, most, composed mostly of nitrogen, which slowly escapes the planet um, in the nighttime when that ice freezes again. And that is our solar system. Wow, right on the, on the money with uh, that 40 minute time estimation. Um, now, there are many other objects, many other dwarf planets, uh, as well as comets and asteroids that orbit our sun, as we can see here. Um, and you can explore these using a piece of software like Space Engine or other uh, applications that I'm sure you can find online. Uh, I'm going to answer just a couple questions since we did get some come in, um, but we don't have a ton of time. I want to remind you that we are going to do a question only uh, or question and answer only live stream on Friday. David asks, how long will it be until our sun becomes a red giant? About 4 billion years, uh, at which point the sun will finish fusing its hydrogen into helium and it will expand into what we call a red giant star. Um, and then, uh, because our sun is not big enough to contain its mass and fuse heavier elements, it will continue expanding and leave behind a planetary nebula. 
All right. Let's see other questions we've got. Hey, yeah, or uh, Tim asks, how is the density of a planet determined? That's a really great question. Um, you can use uh, math and physics to measure uh, this, the movement, the shape of the movement, the speed of the movement of objects, um, and uh, use that information and some constant equations, uh, constant numbers and equations to determine an object's mass. Um, and then you can compare an object's mass with its size to determine its density, and then use other uh, 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 hypotheses and, and educated guesses based on what we know about the composition of planets. Um, some of the gaseous planets like Jupiter and Saturn, we know a lot less about their composition. Uh, for example, we don't know if they have solid cores on the inside. Um, so it's harder to determine uh, their density, but the solid planets, that's a little bit easier. Uh, Jason's saying we would love one that focuses on the inner planets and then one on the outer. Uh, great feedback. I'll definitely consider that. Um, we did, There's definitely a ton of information, plenty of information to cover. Um, we could probably do a whole show on just one planet. Um, David asks, what's the meaning of the name Europa? Europa is one of the uh, moons of Jupiter, one of the Galilean moons. And uh, Europa was actually the name of a princess that was kidnapped by Zeus, the king of the Greek gods in Greek mythology. Many of the moons of Jupiter are actually named after various children that were kidnapped by the king of the gods, which kind of makes sense. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the moons of Jupiter were, in a sense, kidnapped by Jupiter's gravity. Jupiter, by the way, is the Roman version of the same god Zeus. Uh, Melissa suggests a stream of moons only. That could definitely be fun. There are a lot of moons to talk about. Uh, Kristen asks, what will the sun become after burning out? That's a great question. Um, so uh, the sun will uh, turn into a red giant and it will actually fuse some heavier elements like carbon and oxygen, um, but the outer layers will dissipate back out into space and what will be left behind is a white dwarf. A white dwarf is not a star, but the leftover core of the star so it'll be a core of incredibly hot uh, carbon and oxygen uh, that will uh, continue cooling for trillions of years. Um, but uh, that is the leftovers of a star like our sun when it dies. Larger stars, when they uh, die, they'll end up as neutron stars and sometimes black holes. And we just have time for one more question. Um, so let's see. Okay, let's... Well, Melissa, or so Brian is wondering uh, why we have so many asteroids in our solar system. Um, all the asteroids in the asteroid belt, as well as objects that are farther out, and uh, many of the icy bodies like comets that orbit very far away, are left over from the formation of our solar system. Four and a half billion years ago, um, all the materials in our solar system were floating around as a big cloud of gas and debris. And over millions of years, gravity pulled that gas together to form the sun, to form the gas giant planets, and the smaller rocky debris to form the rocky planets like Earth. And then there's some leftover chunks that never quite turned into planets, so they still float around to this day as uh, smaller objects orbiting the sun. But there are millions and trillions of objects that are orbiting the sun, and that is just in our local uh, solar system. And zooming farther and farther out, um, you can see there are some that are really, really far away. But eventually, we reach the edge of our solar system and we see other stars nearby that form other systems of stars and planets. And of those stars and planets, there are 500 million, or 500 billion, excuse me, in our Milky Way galaxy. So that's kind of a nice view to end on. Here is our Milky Way galaxy, our home galaxy. And this does bring us to the conclusion of our little solar system tour for today. Um, I want to thank everyone again for joining us uh, for this fun little live stream. Uh, thanks for bearing with uh, me and trying out this new format. This is our first live stream solar system tour, so I hope it was okay. I hope my jokes landed, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you have any feedback or questions, feel free to keep leaving them in the comments of this video, and we'll uh, be sure to write them down and bring them up on Friday. Uh, just a reminder, Friday at 6 p.m., we're going to do another live stream. Uh, we'll be using this software as well as Stellarium and other software to answer as many of your questions as possible. We'll stick around. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll have enough time to answer all the questions that come in, um, but we'll probably do this stream for about 30 to 40 minutes on Friday as well. Uh, and then just one last thing, uh, I want to 
again, thank all of our visitors and members uh, for supporting Union Station and all of our programs. Uh, to keep these kinds of experiences going, uh, we do really need your help, and we encourage you to go to unionstation.org to find out more about how you can uh, help us uh, during these uh, these uh, uneasy times. And you can find information about membership uh, there as well if you do want to uh, support us by becoming a member, and you can also support us using uh, other direct tax deductible donation methods, uh, which we really appreciate. Every dollar matters. But thanks again so much. Uh, this has been Patrick Hess, uh, your Planetarium Specialist, signing off on another live stream. Thanks again for joining us today, and we'll see you on Friday. Bye, everyone.